thank you for taking the time to join us today to a panel on space and sustainability. I am Nobu Okada, founder and CEO of AstroScale. I founded AstroScale in 2013 to address a space debris issue. Now we are a global company with over 320 employees across five countries. And we are developing the technologies across the spectrum of all orbit servicing, including life extension service, in-space SSA service, end of life activity debris removal. We have grown and evolved a lot since 2013, but our mission remained the same, safe and sustainable development of space for the benefit of the future generations. I am also this year's honorary chair of the World Space Week Association events on space and sustainability. And it is my privilege to host this important conversation. For today's event, I will give a brief introduction of each panelist, then ask them to share a little more about their background before we get into our program. We will save about 10 minutes at the end for audience questions. So if you want to know something about one of our panelists, please submit your question in the Q&A chat area. Okay. Um, so Marushka, I will start with you first. You are currently the executive director of the World Space Week Association. So I'd like to thank you for everything you did to make this event happen. Maruska, but please share a little more about yourself and the organization you present. Also, please introduce this year's WSW theme, Space and Accessibility. Thank you so much for your very kind words and for your uh, willingness to be here today with us and um, also be our honorary chair for World Space Week 2022. We are deeply honored about this and we are so happy to have you and AstroScale working with us because um, as, as you mentioned in your opening speech, you are most definitely pioneers when it comes to space and sustainability. And we are thrilled to be, to be able to partner with you on, on promoting the team and uh, talk more about World Space Week. So in um, every year, our board of directors decides on the team for World Space Week. This year, this theme is space and sustainability. What is really important here is to note the word end because we wanted to focus on both, on how space technologies and applications are helping life on earth, as well as on how um, important it is to maintain space safe. Because once space, outer space becomes unsafe, it becomes unsafe for everyone. So we divided this, this uh, theme into two parts. And uh, since uh, the beginning of 2022, we are leading a social media campaign that is also acknowledging this difference on, on again, on one hand, how uh, space is contributing to betterment of human condition on, on Earth and uh, how important it is to maintain space as a um, um, safe environment. In, um, we, are, we are definitely living in unprecedented times. It's uh, what, what we're doing in space is a, an extraordinary achievement for, for humanity. And we have over 6,500 satellites currently orbiting um, our planet. And uh, this means that it's really, really crucial that we address this, this um, I don't wanna say issues, but that we address the situation. This means that we are encouraging our participants to really discuss this, to look into this and to acknowledge how much space really affects our daily, our daily lives. There are a number of examples for this when it comes to, to SDGs, and um, I hope we can, we can address them uh, a bit later on. But uh, when it comes to the team, like I said, we really wanted to acknowledge this difference. And um, we also wanted to showcase our own values for the association's values for reaching SDGs. We are very much committed to, to that. And um, especially when it comes to quality education, the work for the workforce of tomorrow and partnership for the goals. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariska. Uh, now I understand why you split space and sustainability uh, as a theme. Thank you very much. All right, um, next 
Chris, you are space law advisor for the uh, Secure World Foundation, and you have more than nine years of professional experience in international space law and policy. Chris, please share a little bit more about yourself and the Secure World Foundation. Hi there. Well, thank you for the introduction and good morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone or time appropriate greeting. Indeed, thank you for the introduction. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Space Law Advisor at the Secure World Foundation, which is an NGO focused on space sustainability writ large, uh, which you know, looks at uh, peaceful uses of outer space and extending the rule of law to outer space in those various separate domains. Uh, briefly, I will say that um, w when I teach space law and I teach space law at Georgetown, um, I explain uh, governance of the space domain and governance of activities in the space domain uh, starting in low Earth orbit and extending outward. Uh, however, it is low Earth orbit that is the most rich and complex and diverse uh, domain that we have with the, the greatest diversity of actors, the greatest diversity of activities, uh, and the diversity of opportunities. So it is a very rich uh, and complex environment, uh, less so when we get to geo and less so when we get to planetary bodies and deep space. However, the rules and norms of which we have for low Earth orbit uh, will go on and extend and influence the behavior that we uh, experience and perform uh, in other locations in outer space. And all of this, of course, is under the general framework of international space law found in the Outer Space Treaty, which is a treaty on principles, mere principles governing the activities of uh, actors in space. So, uh, you know, we have a, a, a I would say a paucity of clarity and much work to be done in refining and extending the norms that we have governing our activities in space. And space sustainability, of course, is a pillar uh, underpinning all of the things that we'd like to do in space. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris talked about how different uh, low Earth orbit is. So you said rich, complex, and diverse. So uh, we see more and more applications in low stars orbit. So uh, that's true, and that's why we need to we need to talk about space and sustainability. Thank you. Um, then, Doctor Uma Maheswaran, maybe I can I call you a doc, uh, Doctor Uma Uma. Um, you are the director and distinguished space scientist at the Indian Space Research Organization (ISRO). Also, you are the chair of the UN Copios working group on the long-term sustainability of outer space activities. Dr. Umawa Heslan, please share a little more about yourself and, in, and the important work you are doing both at ISRO and UN Copios. Thank yes. you so much for the, uh, for the introduction. I think you have uh, nicely introduced. So I think uh, uh, nothing more much to add that, uh, as you rightly said, I am the director of Human Space Flight Center, uh, taking care of the Gaganyan program, India's first manned mission to space. Uh, and all, I'm, I'm part of Indian Space Research Organization under Department of Space, which is a Government of India department, uh, uh, directly responsible, I mean, uh, reporting to the Prime Minister of India, Honorable Prime Minister of India. So first of all, thank you very much for the World Space Week Association for inviting me to this part of this uh, very important, very appropriate, I would say, webinar and the panel discussion. I would also like to appreciate the World Space Week Association for selecting a very apt theme, space and sustainability for 2022. Uh, the issue of uh, space sustainability, as uh, all of you said, is becoming a matter of uh, critical importance day by day with the new actors, both private and government, getting into space. Now there is an increased activity, I would say, with the, with the participation of more private uh, enter enterprises and entities coming into this uh, area. At the same time, the humankind is becoming more and more dependent on space for communication, agricultural monitoring, forecast, urban planning, navigation, disaster warning, and mitigation of, I would say, what not. So it's a collective interest of the humankind to ensure 
the sustainable use of this outer space. But as we all know, there are questions about the future of space utilization. The orbits are being congested with increasing number of active satellites as well as with the debris. In this context, again, as you all know, the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space came up with 21 guidelines on the long-term sustainability of the outer space. There has been a notable interest from many of the member states to tune their space activities in adherence to these guidelines. But the corpus, one must know, also felt that the work related to the long-term sustainability should not stop at bringing out these 21 guidelines and established the present working group on long-term sustainability, LTS, with a mandate of identifying and studying the challenges and considering possible new guidelines to long-term sustainability of outer space activities, sharing experiences and lessons learned from implementing the adopted guidelines and also raising awareness and capacity building. I must say that I, I consider myself very fortunate to get elected as the chair of this new working group on LTS. I would like to compliment the World Space Week Association for once again organizing this webinar as capacity building and awareness raising is extremely crucial to space sustainability. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uma. Uh, the, you talked about very important things. So at the UN, there are uh, long-term sustainability guidelines, but you mentioned about how it should evolve for the next steps. So it's quite critical for that. This is related to the, uh, what Chris mentioned about the governance. So uh, thank you very much. We can dig into more about uh, uh, UNCOPUS uh, activities. All right. So um, the, let's thank you for sharing a little about yourselves and a great introduction. And then uh, for Mariuska, thank you for introducing the the World Space Week uh, and, and theme. And then, uh, and then now let's get you to know you and the important topics that the theme entails even better through our questions. Let me, let me start with uh, Chris. The, I think now people understand the space sustainability are key issue, but can you elaborate on how the long-term sustainability of the space environment and the space activities within us uh, are, how threatened, how urgent these are. Why is it problematic? And what can the generic public do to tackle the growing issues? These are um, important questions. Uh, unfortunately, they're very difficult to answer. <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe we can get to that later about what the general public needs to know, because, uh, you know, the general public is also um, a populace which benefits from space and which interacts uh, with space activities and space capabilities uh, and is also, you know, is inspired by space and taxpayers fund a lot of space activities. So I cer certainly think that there's a lot for the, the, the average person, the average citizen to learn about space activities. But Getting back to the first part of your question about uh, where we are in space sustainability and uh, do we have some urgent pressing issues? You know, I think um, in the I would say in the last 10 or 15 years, this concept of space sustainability has gained traction, it has gained adherence, it has gained proponents and campaigners for space sustainability. And so uh, not just my organization, but in fact, uh, numerous organizations and actors and stakeholders and commercial companies uh, and academics have got on board with the concept of space sustainability, which is uh, akin to sustainable development in other domains. It, it essentially is you know, being thoughtful and rigorous uh, in your planning and considering the consequences of your action. You know, uh, it is, considering that what you do in the space domain will affect and can affect others and therefore should you do it. It's also thinking what would happen if others acted how I act? If I do, if I act this particular way, 
would I want other actors to also follow suit and act in the way that I am acting? So having, you know, considering the externalities of your action and the fact that your activity and your behavior is precedent setting. So that's what it is kind of conceptually is that, you know, if uh, sustainable development is that, um, of course, the famous definition is, is that, uh, you know, if what you're doing now uh, may suit your needs and the needs of the present generation, but is it sustainable into the future? Can further can future generations uh, seize the same opportunities and capabilities that, and in fact, resources that you're seizing on, or is something being depleted by your use, uh, by your behavior? Something being depleted, or something being weakened, or polluted, or spoiled? So we have we have understood slowly that this is a concern for the space domain. And that in fact, you know, um, it is not a domain which is, um, we can endlessly put debris there or endlessly populate. We've gotten there, but I think that the, you know, next steps are, is, is having that difficult conversation of, um, does space sustainability mean foregoing opportunities, foregoing, uh, you know, activity that you would like to do. You would like to put as many satellites into orbit. You would like to um, seize as many places in, in, in space. But does space sustainability actually mean that you have to forego opportunities? And are you willing to forego opportunities? And if you don't do it, are other actors also willing to forego opportunities? I think that I hope we don't fall into that type of binary trap, that 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 binary conception, that in fact it means less in profits and less in opportunities, and that space sustainability merely just means a lessening of your ambitions. Um, when we think about it in a richer sense, it actually means, um, you know, what you do, you can continue to do, and other actors can continue to do. It is not you know, uh, logging the forest or, um, you know, grazing all of the resources, it, it's doing so in a sustainable manner so that however you behave now, you can continue to behave just like that in the future and other actors can continue to behave just like that in the future. We're slowly get on, getting on board when, when we look at uh, space debris, but it will require actors to not just set rules for others to adhere to, but for you know yourself to adhere to, and that is a difficult conversation uh, to have because people naturally and states naturally want to be as ambitious and productive and and um, profit uh, profitable as they would as they would like to do. So uh, that's a difficult conversation of you and other actors having that discussion and saying we need to behave in ways that are that is sustainable and that will mean that we'll have to in fact possibly lessen some of the things that we have to do um i'm just giving you kind of the kind of conceptual framework of, of how we think about these things and maybe you agree with what i've just said maybe not yeah thank you chris it's a it's a very good point it's it doesn't have to be foregoing the opportunity foregoing the benefit it's a I, your talk reminds me the example of the highway. You know, there's a highway, and when the number of the car increased, there was a jam, crash, and but uh, we never asked drivers to stop driving. Instead, we brought traffic law and a traffic monitoring system and a road service. If there's a broken car, we tow, and then to make sure highway is environment operationally highway environment operational so i think um that there's a way how you know kind of a, to behave sustainably uh in space it is something you know this is my uh, kind of i felt from your uh the comments but uh, is this something aligned with you or you have a different thought i like that analogy uh, and and sometimes I use the analogy, you know, that that interstate traffic system and the fact that we have rules of the road and traffic laws is that, in fact, if you do have tr a system of rules and, uh, for tr for traffic, for example, and most actors, in fact, almost all actors obey those rules almost all of the time. Yes, there could be some people who speed or go through red lights, but if most actors almost all of the time adhere to those rules, it allows 
a business to grow where they say, well, we can rely on roads, we can rely on the interstate system, we can have some certainty that in fact we'll be able to um, you know, conduct business by using the, this, uh, this system. And therefore, in fact, your profits and your freedom are increased because you're willing to accept some limitations on your freedom. You're willing to adhere to traffic rules. You're willing to stop at red lights um, and uh, you know, go, drive on the correct side of the road. Those are some small limitations on your freedom, but in fact, over the long term, your freedom and your opportunities are increased. Uh, so getting people to understand that there may be short term limitations on what you'd like to do, but in fact, over the long term, you will have richer rewards. Getting people to understand that wager, I think, is one of the tasks that we have to do um, when we think about what we'd like to do in the space domain. That's interesting discussion, uh, the, the, uh, the comments. So, uh, by the way, this is an interactive discussion. So, uh, Maruska, uh, Dr. Uma, if you have any comments, please jump in. Uh, it's a, this is a kind of a very uh, kind of freestyle uh, discussion. So, uh, any, any, uh, any comments from uh, um, Maruska or uh, Dr. Uma for Chris's comment? Uh, probably, I will, I, will, I will add to it when I, I speak. I think. Uh, if you one or two points are there, I thought I will highlight when I speak. That would be more appropriate, I thought. Okay, great. I do have one comment, uh, which I think is really interesting because um, we get. I, I like the, uh, uh, the the traffic analogy because we get, and I'm sure this is true for for all the speakers in this webinar. We get a question of why does this matter if we have so many issues on our own planet, and. Um, once you look closely, you realize that everything we do in space, as a matter of fact, influences the way we live every day and how connected we are, how healthy we are, um, our opportunities and um, our overall happiness, basically, and uh, quality of life. So in, because of this, it's so important that we really continue space exploration in a sustainable manner. Because if we do that, then there is a place for everyone to, to enjoy the benefits of that. If we don't, then we will all suffer the consequences. Yeah, that, that's a good, great uh, remark, uh, Maruska. Maybe, Maruska, can you elaborate a bit more about why the, this theme, space accessibility, is so important this year, 2022? Do you have any? So I, I've been every year um, for the past two, three years, I've been saying that our themes are very much relevant. In 2020, we had satellites improve life. And uh, as it turned out, we needed satellite technology more than ever to stay connected with one another, to maintain some sense of having social circles and um, having friends and, and not being completely on our own because of the, um, the global situation we were facing at that time. Last year, we dedicated World Space Week to women in space, which was uh, very much focused on SDG 5. And this year, with this continuity of focus on what really matters for everyone's um, life on Earth, we chose to have an overall theme of space and sustainability. And uh, here, I would actually like to talk a bit more about um, sustain sustainable development goals. Because what's really interesting to me is that we have 17 goals identified that are the most important. Out of those 17 goals, we have 169 targets that we need to reach to achieve the goals. Now, every single time that we, we have this question of why does it matter, I come back to these targets. Because out of 169, 65 targets are directly influenced and directly benefit from space technologies. Now, I'm not a scientist, I am a, I'm a policy person. And um, that does not mean to me that it's only scientific exploration that, that is important, right? Because um, there's a number of, of effects that space sustainability and the exploration has on our our uh, daily lives, one being education, um, which is of utmost importance to our, our um, association. 
because if we manage to get more people educated and get them access to education they did not have before, again, everyone benefits and we improve the quality of life of every single individual. Thank you, Maruska. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. I mean, I, I, I know, I knew uh, the daily lives on Earth are depending a lot to the space technologies more than ever. And that maybe our next generation will be more dependent. But out of the 169 goals, you said 65 are dependent on the space uh, technologies, space applications. So um, uh, that, that's quite uh, amazing. And, uh, you know, for example, we know disaster management, uh, flood, fire, or whatever. Uh, without satellite, we cannot come up with the how to gather the information, how to make measures. But uh, that's what just one example. So um, uh, that's, that's great. Um, right, let me uh, uh, turn over to uh, Dr. Uma. So you already mentioned about uh, your activities of long-term sustainability at the Unicopius, but uh, uh, can you elaborate a bit more? And then, you know, due to the, this urgency, uh, what should happen at the next? And then uh, how this, also maybe I, I'd like to ask you how this kind of a event like World Space Week can contribute uh, to the uh, section in the guidelines of the long-term sustainability for your work? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, before uh, going to that, I thought, uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, I thought Chris was spot on uh, when he made the uh, uh, the comments on uh, the, I think he covered the, I would say the spectrum of the sociological as well as the uh, psychological aspects of uh, uh, space sustainability. I, I, I put it in that context. It was very, very uh, uh, relevant points, uh, which needs to be, I don't think uh, we, we really have answered those points. And your analogy of uh, uh, the highway was, uh, I, I really loved it. Because that's, uh, there, is a, there is, I don't, I, I consider there is no better way to explain than uh, what you have explained. But uh, one important thing, if you carry forward the analogy of the highway itself, I think the most important thing is similar to that, we need to have a mechanism of uh, just like uh, traffic uh, management we need to have a space management i think we need to we have a long way to go this is my personal opinion uh, the effort that uh, un corpus uh, is taking is with respect to that only and the uh, the all the member states coming to an agreement uh, with respect to at least 17 guidelines i think it's a very very important step but i think it is i consider this as only the first step so we need to go a long way uh, as far as uh, this particular aspect is concerned. Uh, I feel that uh, the, uh, the long-term sustainability of outer space has been an agenda in the scientific and technical subcommittee of uh, UN Corpus for quite a long time, as you know. I think the entire gamut started in two, as early as 2010, uh, uh, when uh, it is good that the member states uh, at that time itself considered this as extremely important when even the present scenario of a cluster of huge clusters of satellite coming into space has become a reality. Um, so the working group uh, 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 is basically as an extension of the concept of sustainable development as uh, Maruska was telling. Uh, definitely both are distinct. Uh, I will come to the sustainable developmental goals also separately. Uh, the working group initially, as you know, was chaired by Peter Martinez of South Africa. So uh, we, I, I know for 10 years they deliberated and uh, ultimately came out with the mutually acceptable 21 guidelines, which was adopted in the 62nd uh, uh, corpus on 2019. Uh, so as I said, uh, this is this itself was a great uh, achievement, I would say, to to have a consensus in this aspect because uh, the the sentiments or the points that Chris highlighted. I think played a very dominant uh, role in uh, in coming at this uh, at this particular consensus. All the uh, conflicting emotions and conflicting requirements: should I do? Should I not do? If I don't do, will, will the other fellow do it? That kind of uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, approach only uh, dominates the entire uh, issue. Uh, 
so that's why I again say that the 2019 consensus was a very, very important milestone. Uh, the member states, uh, I, I, the, the, when I was uh, chairing the LTS session, I felt that the, all the member states were genuinely and honestly, I think they have realized the importance of this sustainability of auto space. And uh, the, the, I think the creation of the second work group itself, uh, I, should, I, my, I must say that was a, was a real uh, earnest uh, demand or earnest thought process in them to continue this process as I said earlier, because this is still in the nascent stage. Uh, I could really feel that uh, the, the passion that the member states had in, in this particular topic. Uh, I personally, let me say that uh, we have a very huge task before us. Uh, in one hand, the member states have to be encouraged and they have to be assisted to implement these adopted guidelines in their own space activities. And on the other hand, the existing and emerging challenges have to be identified and studied to avoid possible new guidelines. Because the, the emerging scenario, I, I must say that is extremely dynamic and highly fast moving because technology the development itself is spiraling. Uh, I think the working group also needs to assess the emerging space nations, uh, the new space, nascent space, space countries, developing countries, and uh, we need to spread the awareness especially raising uh, the capacity building efforts so that they also at, from the beginning itself get benefited from the use of this outer space as only for peaceful activities. So this is uh, the, I, I feel this is the crux of the entire uh, gamut and this is the crux of the effort that is going on in the LTS discussions. And coming to your second question with respect to how does, uh, what is the relevance with respect to World Space Week uh, how they can contribute. I genuinely feel, as you all know, the 21 guide, I will talk about these 21 guidelines because the other two are still uh, being discussed only. We don't have a much, uh, we are not, much clarity is yet to emerge. These 21 guidelines, they are basically grouped into four categories. One is policy and regulatory framework for space activities. Second is safety of space operations. Third is international cooperation, capacity building and awareness. And four is, fourth is the scientific and technical research and development. I feel that the, uh, the guidelines under category C, specifically international cooperation, capacity building and uh, awareness is where I feel really the organizations like World Space Week Association can play a very significant and important role. Because basically, as you know, the guidelines encourage the non-governmental entities to promote public awareness of space applications for the sustainable development, environmental monitoring, disaster management, emergency response to information sharing, etc., which is practically the crux of sustainable developmental goals, I would say. So uh, uh, if you take the example of India, for example, now the I would say more than 80% of these uh, efforts are purely based on space. Uh, Maruska was uh, talking about uh, education. I would say, apart from education, even medicine, space medicine is an extremely important uh, activity through which uh, uh, the different uh, remote areas are getting connected for specific or specialist doctor's advice. And uh, that's a very, very uh, uh, essential and very noble activity which needs to be further uh, developed. So sustainable development goals, are, uh, I fully agree that now it is dominated by the space technology, and we must harness that, utilize it, and uh, optimally develop it. I think that is extremely important. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, one more point which I would like to uh, uh, would like to say that the, the the different gamut or different spectrum of actors that are coming into the fray. For example, you have state governments, you you have startups. You have academic institutes. They, all these are now uh, more and more getting into space. And the government policies are also encouraging them to come invest and do these space activities. I feel there's an immediate requirement for creating awareness for conducting these activities in a sustainable manner. So I think here also, uh, the spreading of LTS guidelines, uh, uh, the World Space Week organization can play a a uh, very important role. That's what I think. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Uma. Uh, it, this is actually very rare opportunity to, to have an opportunity to directly talk with you and then you can directly speak out what kind of activities you are doing at UN Cultural Working Group. So um, maybe uh, Maruska, Chris, please jump in in a, a questions and comments, but uh, you know, let me take advantage of being a moderator and ask us the first question to Dr. Uma. So as you mentioned, uh, LTS guideline, 21 guidelines, a huge achievement. And then I, I, I actually witnessed uh, in the Vienna. And then it took nine years from 2010 to 2019. Today it's 2022. And as Maruska mentioned, SDG's goal is 2030. And then I'm ticking, clock is ticking. So how do you see the, you mentioned four categories of actions, but how do you see the, next progress of the timeline would look like. And, and if you have any thoughts, Dr. Uma, uh, that'll be very appreciated. Uh, thank you for that very important question. Uh, uh, because as you rightly said, to come to an understanding uh, and come to a consensus uh, uh, with the conflicting interest and conflicting requirements of each member state uh, being considered uh, the, I, the nine, it took nine years, as you rightly said. Uh, and uh, uh, But I think that itself is a major achievement because uh, more than 60 to 70 percent of uh, what we envisage now, as on now, with respect to the sustainability, has been reasonably well covered in these 21 guidelines. So I personally feel that a genuine, honest implementation of these 21 guidelines by most of these member countries itself will be a great beginning and that will be a, that itself will be a great act of sustainability i would say that is that is number one but the uncertainty part which i would like to say is uh, something different uh, i also would like to in maybe in a lighter vein i would say that the second working group uh, we started uh, middle of last year and uh, within uh, within eight months we could succeed in come to an agreement for the terms of reference the methods of work and the work plan. I think that's a huge leap to get a consensus in less than nine months, considering nine years for guidelines, at least this aspect, which is the most important aspect because without that, you cannot start working. So that 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 thought process was there in everybody's, every member state's mind. Probably that also really urged them to come to a consensus. So that is, a now we have a framework to start our work. That's the most important thing. So. That speed with which we could come to a concurrence itself is very, very positive, and it's a good sign, a good omen, I would say, with respect to what is in store for us. So I am very positive in that, uh, uh, in that aspect. But the uncertainty, I would say, is with respect to the dynamics of the kind of uh, uh, requirements that are coming out and the kind of technology which is based on those requirements that is getting developed. I think that is it is almost we are reaching a state of mind-blowing kind of scenario. Earlier, a new technology, if I say it took uh, five years to mature, now in four months, a new technology is getting mature. That's the kind of uh, scenario that is happening. And uh, so the, the kind of uh, out-of-the-box thinking with respect to technology uh, is becoming more and more regular. And uh, we, we are re really unable to predict what is going to be in store of us in the next six months. And the point is that those the implementation of those technologies entirely change the gamut of what we are doing till now. So we need to recoup ourselves, restart again, and try to uh, try to bring back the, uh, the 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 speed or the or the or the velocity with which the sustainability act was going on. I think that is uncertainty. That is why uh, UN Corpus also is uh, uh, very 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 uh, serious about. What are the kind of emerging uh, emerging guidelines, if at all, which needs to be discussed at the earliest? Because we need to be prepared ourselves. Uh, we should not be caught off guard at some point of time and then scramble ourselves to uh, rectify or try to resolve the scenario. That kind of scenario should not come. So uh, the emerging guidelines is extremely important. The third point is, which which we definitely can do, is communication or uh, or the kind of uh, uh, the dissemination of the knowledge of how uh, the spacefaring nations are implementing their guidelines to the developing new players who are emerging quite in a good number so that at the beginning itself, beginning stage itself, they can be prepared 
and they can start with the implementation of the guidelines itself so that uh, things are more as you said you know uh, the the traffic management becomes much more uh, easier than what we envisage this is what i feel thank you Thank you, Dr. Uba, and thank you for sharing uh, the current activities. Also, a sense of urgency uh, Unicopus have right now. Um, Chris, uh, Maruska, do you have any comments, reactions, or questions? I do have one question. To, to my knowledge and recollection of the first set of LTS guidelines, the committee really was focused on writing down and codifying existing best practices for existing activities and capabilities. It was not looking toward the future activities. It was saying, what are the best practices now? Is that the same uh, posture uh, as exists for the current LTS working group? Or are you looking also at emerging and further uh, capabilities and technologies? I, it seems as though you hinted that possibly you are, but I just want to uh, draw that out. Uh, uh, let me once again clarify. I exactly said uh, what you asked. The, uh, the 21 guidelines, as you rightly said, has been, uh, I would say, a collection or a, or, a, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a consolidation, I would say, of the uh, the so-called best practices that is uh, that is being done. Of course, I think two three guidelines are also futuristic looking, definitely. Uh, there were some some guidelines uh, also were discussed which were not agreed upon that we could not get some consensus on that uh, that also was there so uh, the the three pillars i would say of the uh, lts uh, three pillars what we what what is being told with respect to terms of reference of the new committee clearly identifies that apart from implementation of the 21 guidelines and apart from dissemination of information and the uh, kind of uh, capacity building activity that is needed, we need to have uh, keep our eyes open and have a discussions on the possible new requirement of possible new guidelines that can emerge. This is very clearly mentioned. And all the three are given equal importance. It is not as if the first guideline, first we are talking about guidelines, then we come to capacity. It is not so. All the three guidelines are to be, all the three pillars have to be equally attended to. That is very clearly made. That is a terms of reference that's very clearly mentioned and written also. I hope I clarified your doubt. Thank you. Mariska? Um, yeah, I, I have several comments actually. Uh, but first, I would like to thank Dr. Uma for, for his kind words when it comes to Workspace Week Association. We will um, absolutely do our best to support you and the working group and um, to contribute as much as we can to capacity building and awareness raising uh, efforts. Um, we've been We've been already already discussing this within the the association on on how to do this best because uh, as you know we are not a political organization so we are very much um, uh, trying to remain open for everyone so we we do not take any any stances on um, on um, on political views but uh, we most definitely will be contributing to, to to the discussion on capacity building and awareness raising especially because for to, to reach space sustainability, we need three aspects. We need technology, which we almost have. We need capital and we need a political will. And um, when, it comes to, when it comes to all three together, organizations like World Space Week Association can definitely contribute because we give people a voice. We bring together such a, such a big crowd of new generation of people interested in space who didn't know there's actually space in there uh, here for them. We, we truly bring together so many people that, that can positively contribute to these discussions and uh, to, to the future that I'm sure that there's gonna be, be a space for, for us as well. Um, probably the most important um, 
aspect that we can contribute to is going to be the workshop, I believe next year, um, led by, by the um, LTS working group, if I understood correctly, where we, we and other NGOs can actively contribute with, with what we do. And um, then I would be more than happy to present more, more um, about the outcomes of World Space Week 2022, what was done, what our participants did, what we discussed with the um, partner organizations, and I'm and I'm sure it's going to contribute significantly to the to the work of the working group. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Novo. Uh, can I just uh, say a few words? Yes, of course. Yes. Thank you, uh, uh, Maruska. Uh, first of all, let me uh, because. Uh, uh, I let me. I wanted to tell this earlier, but once again, let me fully compliment uh, your association for this topic. Uh, but my humble request, again, as I said earlier, is that uh, please don't stop at this. <laughs> so uh, in, include awareness raising in sustainable use of outer space as a permanent agenda in all your future editions of World Space Week celebrations and and your other activities of your association. Because that is that is one way. Because you know the World Space Week uh, is uh, the, the spread of World Space Week is really worldwide. I know because I have been spearheading the World Space Week uh, in 2014 to 2017 as part of ISRO. I was spearheading that the World Space Week celebrations in India. So uh, uh, I know the kind of activities that we participate, and I know the kind of reach that you can do for a huge population that we have in India. So the power of communication, at the same time, the easiness of communication through these means is uh, tremendous. So you have a great opportunity to, to, to send this message of uh, space sustainability across the world if you make it a part of your, a permanent a part of your agenda. That is what I would request you. And as a chair of LTS Working Group, I personally offer my full support for all these activities. So I wanted to say that this is this, this is also my personal opinion. So thank you very much. I would like to say that. thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ma. Maybe uh, Chris, can I ask a quick question related to this conversation? So uh, when the topic comes to the space accessibility, what's a role of the non-governmental organization like the Secure World Foundation? Maybe I know the answer, but for those who don't know, don't know about your great activities, please share your thoughts. Yes, yeah, certainly. I'll try and make it quick. You know, as an NGO and an actor in civil society, we're not operating spacecraft and we're not regulating uh, space activities. So what role do we really have to play? Well, in fact, we are a stakeholder and some of the some of the most crucial and, and important interventions and actions that we can do is really just convening meetings to get to break down silos, to increase empathy and understanding between different actors in the space domain. Um, I would say drawing out people to share their concerns, to share their, 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 you know, what they would like to do and what they also would not like to have happen. And it is really just trying to be a trusted a uh, convener of meetings and a trusted actor and authority that can speak not purely on behalf of governments or on behalf of private industry, but on behalf of everyone else who uses the space domain or who benefits from the space domain. So COPUS is a meeting of member states. We're an observer at COPUS, um, you know, it, it, but it is not just states and corporations who have a say in discussing space sustainability. In fact, it's everyone else. So as an NGO, we try as best we can with a small team and we, we you know, welcome partnerships with all those other members in civil society who, uh, who also, like, like World Space Week, um, who care about space sustainability and the future for everyone. Wonderful. Thank you very much uh, for talking about space and sustainability. We have multiple stakeholders like NGOs, uh, World Space Week, uh, UN operators, governments, and, and we need to encourage multi-stakeholder discussions. So I just uh, realized we have uh, 
bunch of questions already. So uh, uh, we have a mindful time, but let me pick up uh, some questions. And then um, uh, number one, in the, uh, hold on, let me, oh, um, in order to achieve space accessibility and the SDGs, all countries need to collaborate with each other. How do you see current international cooperation on space accessibility? Um, we touched on some examples, but do you have any comments, anybody? I would say by and large, it is good. Just like, um, you know, most actors, almost all actors adhere to almost all of the rules almost all of the time. It is only the exceptions, only the bad actions which are newsworthy and which people complain about. But by and large, actors are adhering to the rules and willing to adhere to the rules. We just have, have to make sure that that continues to be the case. Thank you. Any other comments? I believe the overall um, collaboration and cooperation in the space sector is much better than in almost any other field. There's no mm. borders when when you when you leave the planet. We all have to work together. There's no citizenships. There's no uh, problems that we have here that we take with us when we explore outer space. And um, I, I think, at least to me personally, that gives a lot of hope that we can actually overcome our differences and issues that we have. So um, overall, I'm very optimistic. I think um, space sector really does bring people together. Yeah, my uh, my experience uh, as chairing of uh, LTS, uh, I get the same conclusion because uh, there are differences uh, that nobody can deny. But there is a willingness in all the parties to discuss, sit across, uh, debate, brainstorm, and then come to a positive conclusion. That desire is there cutting across the countries in the world as far as the space sustainability is concerned. This is the feel, this is the kind of uh, uh, vibe that I'm getting when I chair the session. So definitely, I think it's very positive. That's my opinion. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, the collaboration is happening globally. Uh, but uh, if I can make a small comment, the, the, to solve this issue, there are far away, a long way to go. So uh, we need a more and more efforts on a daily basis. Uh, so that's my thought. Um, okay, next. Um, how to we resolve the issue of the space junk already up there? Anybody? No, boy, if I may, maybe this question is best uh, answered by you. You are the, the expert on how to how to tackle the issue of space debris. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Um, but uh, Chris, you want to say something, right? Please go ahead. I mean, it starts with Article Eight of the Outer Space Treaty. States retain jurisdiction and control and ownership of their launch space objects, whether those objects are functioning or non-functioning. Uh, and by and large, that is good. Uh, for fifty plus years, that has worked out just fine. But it is a problem when we start talking about salvage rights. Uh, I would like that. I would like it to be clear and permissible for actors to remove space debris that doesn't serve a purpose and is non-functioning, and we can't identify the launching state. Uh, I would like uh, actors to be able to salvage that and repurpose it and use it, and and make it possible for them to do so in a, in a profitable manner. Um, that's a different discussion than the, the space debris that we can, for who's registering and launching state we can identify. But for the small pieces of debris, we do need to take some type of action to create salvage rights. That's my uh, thing I've been thinking about. Um, the Fudi agree with me if I may add some comments. So uh, uh, recently, the active debris removal program for removing the existing debris is happening. So in Japan, UK, EU, and US will come soon. So uh, the, I think the current domestic programs is coming. Uh, but uh, 
uh, as you see in space, we need international collaboration. But uh, we have done so many uh, international collaborations, like space exploration, science, right, whatever. So uh, to do that, uh, Chris, I agree with you. Uh, we need to solve the salvage right uh, issues, and then uh, that's a critical, right? Okay, uh, let me move on to next one. Um, the Okay, so it's hard to pick up. <laughs> uh, there are, and so I mean, let me take one. Oh, this is a question, Chris. In the absence of the outer space treaty reform, can international environmental law help fulfill the regulatory gaps and ensure sustainability in space? This is a great question. Thank you to whoever submitted that. Yeah, I, you know, as I said at the top of the, the top of the hour, the Outer Space Treaty is a treaty on principles. It has basic elements of, you know, uh, due regard, uh, prohibition on harmful contamination, and and obligations of cooperation and mutual assistance found in Article Nine. Uh, we have the freedom of exploration and use, and if state a enjoys a freedom then state b has an obligation or a duty to not infringe upon that freedom but beyond that uh what can environment international environmental law tell us well when i look to the principles of international environmental law i see things like the uh, precautionary principle and the polluter pays principle and i think that those apply in principle to outer space activities. They are foundational to international law, uh, international environmental law, and I think that they also apply in principle to space activities. How, they, how that shakes out and applies concretely though, uh, we don't know for certain, but I, I would argue that they do. So thank you for that question. I encourage you to write an article about it. Thank you, Chris, thank you very much. So thank you uh, for audience for sending us the questions, but uh, uh, it's time. So uh, uh, and then that's our time for today. But before we before we go, I have a special sneak peek for all of you. It is my honor to unveil our 2022 World Space Week poster. Can you show the poster? All right, great. So this year's poster will be published on the World Space Week Association website shortly and will be downloadable from there. Okay, so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it's great discussion and dialogue. Look for a more engaging events highlighting space and sustainability during World Space Week, October 4 to 10. So thank you everybody. Have a good night, good day, and good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you Novokarta, Chris and uh, Manuska and all the, all the people who have attended. Thank you very much.